previously introduced, it's about processing multi-queue messages using demonized processes <coughs> in PHP. Uh, my name is Simo, and uh, I'm a developer at Eastman. Uh, we are a company which does a lot of Facebook advertising, and we use this technology in order to improve the way we handle uh, long-running jobs. Okay? Uh, Nicola and I would like to share with you guys today uh, some of the experience and ideas we had while implementing this approach. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, today we are going to cover, cover several topics, uh, and uh, Nicola will now start the workshop with introduction to demonization. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Nicola, I work at Homes Technologies. Today I will talk about demonization. So, let's first see what we wanted to build. We wanted to have an application that will run in the background. It will listen to some cues and process the messages that we get from these cues. This application should be available 24-7 all the time. And it should process messages as soon as possible. So, this kind of sounds for, as a good candidate for a demon. Why a demon? It runs as a background service. It's completely detached from the terminal. It runs autonomously. And normally, <coughs> every demon waits for requests and spawns child processes in order to process and handle this. So, these are the steps that one should take in order to create a demon. First, if you want to have an exclusive demon process, you need to project if the demon is already running on your system and it goes up to the effect. This is optional. And the most important step is forking the child process of the demon, of your parent process. So, by forking, you will exit your parent process and continue working with the child, uh, which will work now in the background. The third step is also optional, it's related to the first one, write in the PID files in case you want to have your daemon uh, exclusive. Even though your daemon now is, runs in the background, it doesn't mean it's completely independent. To make it independent, you need to have a new session group and assign this daemon to be the session group leader. Unix has session groups and process groups. Every session group has, can have multiple process groups, while process group can belong only to one session group. When you start the process from a shell, the shell has its own session group, and all the processes that belong to this session group. When you do set session ID, it creates the new session group, and your demon becomes the session group leader and the process group leader. Thus, it makes it completely independent. Uh, it would be a good practice to change the demon directory to some, to some known directory in the system. Why? Well, if you run a demon from a directory that is mounted on your system, you will not be able to unmount it later. So, I've seen some implementations which use root system directory as a directory for the demon, but you can use any one that you are sure about. Uh, it's good that you take complete control of the permissions that your demon writes, uh, in files that your demon writes. So, you have to set the new mask that you want to use for the files that you write by closing the mask. And <clears throat> you don't know what was the new mask that your demon, that your child inherited from a parent. And that's not the only thing that your child processing is inheriting from a parent. It also inherits file descriptors. And uh, it's not the really without the file descriptors. So you would like to close all of them and open new files, new file descriptors that you will use as uh, for logging purpose. It's also good practice to assign signal event handlers because you don't have any interaction with your demon via terminal. Only way you can interact with it is 
by sending signals. Some of the common signals to cover are those two for termination. We have two signals for user that are custom the signals for some user messages, and we have hangout signal and child signal. Hangout normally is used for reloading the configuration signals, and the child signal is sent by the children forked from a demon process. Everything that I talked about is drawn on this diagram. So we start by forking, and we have two branches now. The parent branch will exit immediately, while the child branch continues for the implementation of all the steps that I mentioned, and it ends up by processing the main logic of the daemon. The main logic, in almost all the cases, is an infinite loop, which forks uh, new children for handling the messages that you got uh, by having a precondition in case you have a new message and you fork this uh, child. In case you don't, you just continue looping. And the run child is a method that is actually defining the body, the main body of the child, of the handler. Normally, parent processes should take care about its children. So we have a part where we clean up all the dead jobs. And it's uh, also very good if you dispatch your signals at every cycle, because some might be triggered in the meanwhile, so you want to have them dispatched so as soon as possible. After it gets the stop signal, it will just clean all the processes it forked before. This is a concrete implementation or class that we have. Uh, it's an abstract class for demonization, so if you want to have a demon process, you will have to extend this. And we have defined here, uh, declared, four abstract methods. One is for precondition, if you need for another child. One is for uh, having the main body of the child, it's the front child. And we have some hook methods here, which are called whenever you start or stop the child process. Later you will see an example with these two concrete uh, demons. that we have a sample demon and a QD demon. Normally, when you create a daemon, you would like to register that as a service on your system. So you can easily call it after we start, stop, restart, and reload, which are, in fact, very simple comments. So reload just sends kill minus 15 signal, uh, stop just, uh, sorry, reload sends kill minus 1, or hang up signal, stop sends kill minus 15, restart just starts and stops, Stops and starts and starts just involves the script. There are some problems that you might face when you load your file descriptors. So each bit has three constants that keep standard input out of file descriptors. SD, SD out, and SD dead. When you close file descriptors, they you cannot assign new file descriptors to these constants because they are constants. And uh, you might end up with a problem. You might end up being blind, actually, because you cannot see what's happening tomorrow. Because you will write something in the computer. Or at least the trigger error will not show up. So you don't know you have an error. And that's a pretty big problem, because you think everything works fine. In order to overcome this, I have used an uh, the library is an uh, EIO extension for PHP, which is implemented uh, by using the libioc library. And it has a very cool function called dubdo. It actually duplicates a file descriptor. So you provide a new file descriptor for your log, 
And as a second argument, you provide a constant. And it will clone the file descriptor and assign it to a constant, which is a hack because you're changing constants, but first. And I'll show you now an example how it actually works. Let's have a look about some cubes. 
and if you have a lot of messages and only one consumer, it's, the chances are that that one consumer would probably not be able to keep up with the message rate, right? So you will add more consumers, right? And then you will probably uh, run into uh, scaling issues, performance issues, all sorts of tricky stuff like concurrency, consistency, or race conditions, etc. So what would you do then? Um, most obvious choice is use something else for a few engines, right? And we did. So for these use cases, we use RedditMQ. <coughs> now, RedditMQ is actually a full-fledged queuing engine. comes with a lot of features, a lot of, a lot of nice features, specifically designed to help you solve issues around queuing. Right? But for us, actually, the use case is not that much different from the database. And yet, we are able to scale very well with RedditMQ. Why is this? So maybe one of the biggest reasons is the way RedFMQ as a queue engine communicates with consumers. So let's, for example, take a database and consumer. So consumer would every now and then ask database, hey database, do you have any messages for me? Hey database, do you have any messages for me? Etc. Can get annoying, right? <laughs> On the other hand, RedFMQ uh, opens sort of a channel with the consumer, and then once the message is available, it will forward that message to the consumer. Right? This approach actually scales very well. Uh, I, I was mentioning that we have a service for creating those reports. We actually have many services, and majority of them are written in Symfony. And we want to make it easy for our developers to utilize queues whenever they uh, have a need for it. And we also want to make it easy for them to toggle between Revit and QS queue engine and database as a queue engine, right? It should be simple as changing the configuration item. Okay? So we wrote a bundle. Of course. A uh, big part of that bundle is this queuing driver thingy. So queuing driver is actually an abstraction between your application and the queue engine itself. So your application doesn't have it, doesn't necessarily need to know that you're using database as a queue engine or Revit and queue in the queue engine. So all it has to need, all it has to know is that out there there is some queue and I can add stuff to that queue and I can get stuff out of that queue. And that's it. Right? So that's actually a job of a queue driver. Queue driver takes your task. So for example, let's Imagine that you want to download some big video from some website. You would create a PHP class and you would put the logic inside, inside that class. That class actually is a task, right? So you would new up the new object of that class and you will give that object to the driver. The driver will then encode or map that message to the specific queue engine. Okay? Once the message is received from the queue engine, by the consumer is forwarded to the queue driver. The queue driver then takes the message, uh, decodes the message, gets the class name, instantiates a new object, and triggers the processing. Okay? So what we are essentially doing here is we are encoding the type of work, the type of task inside the message. Okay? So this is of course not the only approach, and Nicola will now share with you some other approaches you can take to, to essentially yeah, do so, the similar uh, task. The main difference between, between the, the system that Simo was talking about and uh, that I talked about is actually the way the workers are started. So in Simo's approach, the workers are start based on the type of the message. So you put in, in a queue, you put several types of messages, and these messages uh, have the information what worker should process them. The QD system is actually a bit different. So uh, the worker is registered to, uh, to a queue. So a queue can handle only one type of message. So you want to have, let's say, uploading of images in one queue and uploading of videos in another one. And uh, if you have dozens of videos to upload, and only one image, the image doesn't have to wait those videos to be uploaded because 
their process in parallel. And uh, if you do it in only one queue, and you don't have enough uh, workers, then you know, this image can be delayed uh, because of the video. And that's the main difference. The way how it's implemented. Uh, so, in essence, the QD is a beam. So, it extends, it extends the beam like this, but it uses the queue manager in order to list all available queues at the moment uh, from a broker. And in this case, the broker is Revit and Q, which is, but you can use any, any kind of multi queue instead of it. Whenever there is a new queue available, uh, the queue listener is start. The queue listener uh, gets the message, and the, the message is processed by one of the register, registered workers in the factory. And let's see how this works. So, very simple implementation of a worker. It's a sample worker. And you have to implement only one method. It's called process. So this worker prints a message out, sleeps for some time, and exits. And there is a callback function in order to notify if the message was processed or not. So if you should requeue this message or not. It's also registered as a service. And when I started, we have a message here that the queue listener started listening the sample queue. But nothing happens. In order to make something happen, we have to add a message to the queue. So, and there it is. It's processed as a common, but in this case, these comments are just printed up. So you can send any common to your worker. You can do many, as many as you want, which was uh, many times as well. And they will be processed. In this case, it's processed the one by one, but you can have multiple uh, workers working at the same time in the same queue. And you get the parallelization. And you simply just, when you don't feel it anymore, you just simply stop. Okay, you probably saw one tab open in Firefox briefly, uh, saying something announcements. So that's actually a part of our demo. We would like to show you today. So we actually built a demo to show you guys like what is the full power of queues and uh, being able to. Uh, demonize processes and run processes, multiple consumers in parallel, how would you benefit that? Okay, so let's imagine that we are a company, a startup, of course, successful one, sure. Uh, investors are happy, you have exponential revenue growth, you have a pet friendly office, dog in office, table tennis, all sorts of stuff like that. And let's imagine that you are in games selling business. So you sell games online, okay? And uh, you want to be able to send the notification to all of your users that this weekend you are having 50% off of some games, okay? So some discount stuff. But I think I did the wrong. Okay, okay, so here we are. So the problem use case is that if a user comes to the web page, submits the request, you get the data from the post, right, not from the get. Then you validate, you always validate, we don't trust user input, right? And then you save the announcement because essentially what you are creating is an announcement, you are announcing that you are giving the discount, right? So 
you create an announcement, and then you dispatch the messages to all of your users. So we have three notification channels, so SMS, email, and web. So you can send personalized messages to all of your users via one or via every available channel, right? Then you run the success page. Okay. So not a big deal, right? If you have five users, you adjust them for each or all of your users and send them notification. But it can be tricky if you have 10,000 users, for example. That means that you actually have to send 30,000 notifications, personalized notifications. For each statement, would not fly here, right? Because you would probably run into some time exception or out of memory, stuff like that. So you want to uh, take this complex task and put it in the background. Oh, I did it again. Sorry. <laughs> Can you just move to the last slide? It's okay. So, to the front of the view. To the front of the view. <laughs> okay. I'm leaving the mask. Uh, so, you can offload this huge task of creating 30,000 notifications per user into one single job, but then you will end up processing it like forever, right? What you probably want to do is split that huge task into several smaller tasks, okay? For example, take that giant task and split it into 50 smaller tasks. So you would have, of course, 50 tasks, and then if you have 50 consumers, theoretically, you could send all those notifications in the time it takes just to send uh, 600 notifications, if I did my math correctly. Uh, and this is actually shown here. So we are, uh, you see a web browser, dispatching an announcement, and Dumbo, yeah, by the way, the application is called Dumbo, because Dumbo is an elephant, elephant PHP, makes sense. And so it's just, <laughs> just yeah, <laughs> hopefully, uh, let's just uh, 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 refer to this as a Dumbo. Uh, so, yeah, it will process all those messages, and it will then put the, each message in a separate queue. So email messages would get their own queue, SMS their own, and flag their own. Right? Right, so we have actually changed our, uh, the two systems that we were talking about. So the number workers uh, work in a fashion that they uh, register workers by type of the message, and QD workers are registering workers by the type of the queue. And number workers, in this case, just uh, uh, take the messages that should be sent to the user, they process them, they create the role version of a message and put them back to some different queues, which are then processed by QD workers and then they are really sent to the users. Yes. Should you go to the yes. Okay, so show them. Open the application. Okay, so first, let's start with showing you the... Yeah. Let's make an announcement. Maybe you can show that we indeed have 10,000 users. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and they are really proud, no tables, responsive. Yeah. Yeah. Modern. Okay. So you can make an okay. announcement. So let's send this to all three channels. First, we'll show you all the queues here. We, don't, we have only one queue that was a sample queue that we tested before. And you'll see hi. And you can use these native placeholders. Will, those will be swapped with the real user. So that's what the first. Yeah, personalized touch. For example, yeah, and then just send them. After that, they will create the queue, the announcement scheduler, which has 50 messages in it. And the messages. So as a result, you can keep 
here, see the handle class, that's the part where you encode the message, the type of work inside the message, and some payload. Okay, we can now trigger the processing. Q 
you are giving the whole process? Yes. There is issue uh, when only the connection is skewed. The, the process is working, you are seeing it here, no errors, only the connection. Ah, right, 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 right. right. Okay, skewed. after some time it will be cleaned up. After some time. How yes, I mean, it's a rank resetting all the process and restarting them or? Uh, well, the process will be restarted, of course. Yeah, but the connection to the Revit and Q will be killed, will, yeah, will be closed after some time. And what so you mean like a zombie, zombie, like a zombie connection? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we, we have some problems with that. Yeah, but after some time it gets cleaned up. Yeah, actually, that's uh, that's the thing you probably want to do. So you want to be able to kill your process anytime, and you want to be able to <coughs> recover out of that. Yeah. So, so this this one has uh, been recovered. So I killed it. You see, I killed process 16298 and it created the new one. Let me see. Okay, so it has 17 So it automatically recovers processes which are getting killed. Yeah, but this is in case you uh, you know there is an issue with the So what will happen with your process if it's if it breaks, for example? It has some message in it, and this message is not acknowledged. No, uh, if uh, in, in my case, when the connection is dropped, the process is not understanding for this, it's just working without any connection open to the router. Ah, so the process still works? Yeah, it's working without any errors, without any issues, but the router is not seeing it. And basically, you're just. Uh, ah, okay, the I, I know what happened. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, we had this. You probably uh, don't restart your uh, process. Uh, uh, your uh, connection to the Revit MQ uh, because when you start, uh, it connects to the Revit MQ and waits for a message. Mm -hmm. We restart this connection every five minutes because after some time it goes to zombie uh, zombie state. Uh -huh. If you don't do that, okay. so we restart it every five minutes and this yeah. doesn't help. Okay. Yeah, and actually it, it's a really good approach to do something like that, to have a timeout on connection or even on process. So it may be connection timeout, maybe all sorts of timeouts. It may also be that you have a memory leak, you know. Uh, uh, we in PHP are not that used to memory leaks because the time for request is very short. So you don't you cannot create that big memory leak. But if you have a whole memory, don't restart the process. Yeah, we restart the connection. Just restart the connection to the Reddit. But you should also uh, take into consideration that you could restart the process as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, oh, lot of questions. <laughs> Specific, right? Uh, so you can create the task, give the task to the gearman, and gearman will uh, uh, initialize your environment, whatever, and process your class, your task, right? And here, uh, if you dispatch the message to the queue, uh, nowhere is stated that the receiver consumer has to be written in PHP, right? If, for example, if you want to send a bunch of emails and you use PHP to send Slack messages and SMS, but emails are, uh, for some reason, maybe uh, easier to send using Go language, for example, or some language we all use a lot, like browser. Uh, you then could write a consumer in uh, JavaScript and it would be able to read the message because message itself is not PHP specific, right? It's just a, a JSON object. And it would then uh, be able to take a message, parse the message, and send the notifications. So you can have different technologies on different ends of the queue. Okay. 
Does it answer us? Your question. Are you sensitive? <laughs> I saw her hand there. Ah, yeah. Yes, I, uh, I have a question to the demonization. Yeah. Um, it would be also possible to detach uh, a PHP process with screen or something similar. I expect so. <laughs> why? Uh, what? What is the main benefit of using demonization? Yeah. So, for example, you would probably detach it by no up and understand. Putting that in, putting the process in the background. No help means there is no uh, signal for hang up. So this, pro this signal is ignored. I mean, uh, can you ask yourself if, would you let your process that, for example, has to upload tons of heads to the page? Uh, would you let it run for a year in the background and not having complete control over what it does? No? So this way, you close the file descriptors, you open concrete file descriptors, you handle all the signals, uh, you handle hang-up signal, which is used for reloading your configuration. <coughs> And uh, yeah, so I see a lot of benefits. You can use no hub, you can use screen for processes. For example, you want to parse some log files and that takes two days. You start it, leave it in screen or no hub, and after it's done, your process is closed. But to leave a demon, uh, to leave a process to run several years, well, I think that requires a bit more of details in it. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, blog post very really interesting. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, how do you handle poison messages and uh, one more specific question. Uh, how do you handle a situation when uh, something went wrong, for example, network connection is down and uh, you have uh, maybe fatal errors that you uh, mm -hmm. can hang your uh, messages. So how what, do you what handle What was the first question? When, when the uh, uh, first question is uh, poison messages. Poison? Uh, yeah, yes, poison messages, uh, which contains... Uh, Something that is not handleable. That, uh, can, yeah, handled sure. by, by workers. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, so, uh, we draw an exception. <laughs> yeah, uh, so workers normally implement uh, their uh, logic in it. You implement every worker separately, and if it uh, has, uh, gets a message that is unreadable, it draws an exception, and this message uh, depends on the type of the worker. You can requeue it, for example, but in this case you would probably not requeue it because it's not readable. So you would just throw it away and probably notify someone, no, I got uh, an exception here because the message is not readable. And uh, uh, the second question is, what if the connection is down? Uh, not, uh, not correct. Uh, uh, I think the second question will be related to the first one and, and we want to retry our message mm -hmm. in the case yeah. of uh, general okay. I'll, I'll, give you, I will give you an example. So we have campaigns which we upload, and we have banners which we upload. And banners are related to campaigns. So you cannot upload the banner without, without uploading campaign. But we want to upload them in parallel. And imagine having a campaign and related banner uh, in different queues. So, a campaign is still not uploaded, but banner tries to upload. And it fails because there is no campaign. What we do, we just requeue it. We requeue it and wait the campaign because we are, we are sure the campaign will be uploaded. If it's not, so you can have some timeout or you know, uh, you can have like 10 or 100 requests, uh, counter for requests and just stop it up some time and notify uh, administrators for that. Uh, but we also have cases when we know that if something breaks or cannot be uploaded, we just reject the message. So you're trying to upload uh, 
an object to the API which uh, doesn't satisfy the, the validation of uh, the API rules. And you get an error, so the rules are not valid, that you said, so you will just reject this message completely and notify again the user. So yeah, I guess it is the question whether or not you want to retry that message. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. Sure. sure. But, uh, thank you. One more question. Once. Uh, based on your experience, which is the best way for notifying the user on some issue with a message? And this question is when we're talking for a lot of messages. Yeah, well, depends what do you <laughs> uh, think as a user. So, the user can be a developer. The developer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is an issue with one worker, and uh, for example, for an hour, it well, crashed. 10 million times. Yeah, let, let, let's see like this. Phone call. So we have normally, yeah, <laughs> 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 <In the, Okay>. midnight. <laughs> midnight. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, notifications for users via emails. So for end users, so your campaign is not proposed. But if there is a problem, which so you cannot send this email, <laughs> the problem causes that you cannot send the email then you have log files, and log files are the best thing. So as a developer, that's the final thing that you have to check, so log files, and we do that. And if we see there is something wrong in our logs, we cover that. But the first step is to send an email, and it works. Yeah, the issue is when we're talking for all the uh, messages which are Okay, uh, but we have actually another way of uh, notification to the user. So if you start the job as a user, for example, we have some reporting system that is being generated. So the user can generate reports that are, uh, and these reports are generated in the background uh, from a queuing system. And uh, when the report is done, we pop up the notification on the user browser. So that's another way of communication with users. So, but you can send an email, you can notify them on the browser, or write a log file for, for developers to check. I mean, there are also some use cases where you absolutely you want to have logs. They want to log everything because that's your only way to know, to figure out what is happening. And that's why we developer. use EIO. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe you can have some tool which is processing logs and I don't know, something like a, a, a gray log, something like that, and you can have some alerting system set up there. So for example, if you all of a sudden see a lot of fatal errors, uh, you then can, can send an email to administrators or trigger all kind of rules. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we have a few minutes more to sound. Is this yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. I <laughs> Uh, yeah, how do you handle situation when you receive a signal in the middle of processing request? Yeah, yeah, well, that's why we dispatch signals at the end of the cycle. So you have this uh, parent process, and you can handle signals in child processes as well. Uh, so you do your job, and then dispatch signals. So you wait a uh, request to complete, and then... Uh, yes, yes, you wait a request to complete, we then jump to signal handler. So if you don't have any more questions, uh, I mentioned that there is a fine use case for queues and data replication. I saw. Uh, maybe I can share with you. Sure. Uh, it's about, so you mentioned that you have a database. In this uh, particular example, it was a Postgres database. So they were able to export every uh, query, every data alteration, uh, uh, database table operation, everything, as a patch. And what they did, they put those patches inside the queue. Uh, uh, this term, uh, Apache Kafka, I think, was used as a queue engine. And what those guys were able to do is to replicate the whole database like five minutes from now. I mean, five minutes in the past, ten minutes in the past, uh, one day in the past. 
So it, it was actually quite nice to see it with wide database replication. You know, so if something goes wrong, you can just switch to the database which is two minutes in the past or something like that. But nice use case for working. Never thought of that myself. <laughs> Maybe another question. Freelance function. Okay, it's lunchtime.